What a blessing it is to know and serve a God who is faithful, who can be counted on in all situations. He keeps his covenant and watches over his word to fulfill his promises. Lamentations 3.22 tells us, Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Say it with me. Great is your faithfulness. We humans, on the other hand, are not always so reliable. Saturday, March 9th, began in a leisurely fashion for me. I had nothing on my schedule, so I was taking my time with my morning hot drink and quiet time routine. Then at 9.37 a.m., the phone rang. It was Dr. Stephen Roy, president of Emmanuel Bible College. The Board of Governors had just begun their 9.30 meeting, and Dr. Roy was wondering if I was all right or just on my way. In sudden panic, I realized I had completely forgotten to put the board meeting on my Google Calendar. No wonder they were noticing the secretary was absent. I hurriedly gulped down the rest of my drink, grabbed my laptop, and headed out the door to Kitchener while the vice chair kindly made some notes until I got there over an hour later. We want to be perceived by others as reliable. We want them to be able to count on us, to consider us faithful. We don't want to come across as fickle, promising to be there for them and then not coming through. If others have let us down in the past, we know how disappointing that is, how it damages trust and our confidence in that person. It hurts the relationship. We become cautious or hesitant about ever trusting them again. In the same vein, society views negatively those who are deliberately deceptive and unfaithful, disloyal. To be a traitor is shameful. On March 15th, Roy Rockwell Hansen of Syracuse, Utah, face on the screen there, a former intelligence officer for the American Army and government, pleaded guilty to attempting to steal and deliver national secrets to the Chinese government. Between 2013 and 17, Hansen would attend military and intelligence conferences in the U.S. and provide the information he learned at the conferences to contacts in China associated with the nation's intelligence agency receiving some $800,000 in return. Beginning in May 2016, Hansen attempted to solicit information from a current DIA intelligence officer. Hansen told the other officer how to record and transmit the classified information without raising agency alarms, as well as how to launder the money he received as payment from the Chinese. However, the other DIA officer was actually working as a confidential human source for the FBI, leading to Hansen's arrest. Now at age 59, he's facing likely a 15-year prison sentence. Not quite what he was planning to do for his retirement. God is faithful, not fickle. Psalm 36, 5. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. He can be trusted to keep his word. A nation's security requires it to have confidence in its agents to whom are entrusted vital national information. So those who betray that confidence, who abuse their security clearances, are reprimanded harshly. You don't want your officials doing a flip-flop and becoming agents for the enemy. Loose lips sink ships. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey on Palm Sunday, there was great celebration. Luke 19. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Let's say this, these two lines together. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Yet just five days later on Good Friday, crowds were calling for his elimination. Luke 23. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I'll have him punished and will release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. What happened in the space of five short days that turned public opinion so much against Jesus? How had the wild cheering of Palm Sunday evaporated such that Jesus was so abandoned, cast to the wolves? 
Back in Luke 19, at the triumphal entry, Jesus was making a statement without saying a thing. He organized his entry into the Jewish capital using the format of an important occasion, like a, a conquering general returning home with the spoils of battle. He was mounted on a steed, his followers cheering wildly, spreading their garments on the road, waving palm branches, quite a parade. Except he wasn't mounted on the customary war horse, but on a donkey, a beast of burden. Kind of like the president arriving on a bush plane instead of Air Force One. Huh? That's not how it's normally done. He was kind of making a statement about making a statement. Jesus orchestrated events and said things that someone who's just a good moral teacher would never do. How cheeky to commandeer an animal to ride on for a grand entrance. Luke 19.30. Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, tell them, the Lord needs it. Mm -hmm. Outlandish, unless he really is the Lord. And the Pharisees object to such extravagant praise being given to a mere human, akin to blasphemy. But Jesus refuses to rebuke his followers as if such laudatory exclamations are actually appropriate. 1939. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What? If the humans didn't say it, even inanimate objects would start shouting it. Such a nervy thing to say, so egocentric. Unless, of course, he really is someone divine. Thus, Jesus implicitly acknowledges his kingship, yet he won't be coerced or manipulated or taken advantage of, forced into the conventional framework. You might remember a long time before this, back in John 6, when Jesus fed the 5,000, his popularity had suddenly skyrocketed as a result of the miracle. Here is the guy going to feed us. Yet Jesus, all too aware how fame and power usually work in the world, did not capitalize on his sudden public favor. John 6, 14. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain. So, Psst, don't let the Tim Hortons marketers get wind of this, but did you know there's a donut at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy? That's right, a black hole with a faint circle of light around it. This week, astronomers released a photo of another black hole, one of the biggest ones they think exists in the M87 galaxy, some 500 million trillion kilometers away. That's a little longer than your Sunday graph. It's estimated to have a mass six and a half billion times the size of our sun, and is larger than our entire solar system. That's a big thing. Yet there's a paradox. It may be one of the most massive things in our universe, but it's invisible. You can't actually see it. Just a ring of fire around it. This one on the screen here. Because beyond a certain point, the gravitational pull is so intense, even light rays can't escape. Jesus' approach to power is paradoxical, extraordinary, unusual. He's massive, but kind of a sleeper, too. The crowds hailed him as Messiah. But over the course of Jewish history, that word had become associated with the expectation of a strong military deliverer, like Judas Maccabeus, 191-160 BC, who led a revolt against the Seleucid Empire. In Jesus' time, people hoped for deliverance from Roman political oppression. Hence he had groups like the Zealots, even one of Jesus' own disciples, Simon, that belonged to the Zealots. They would pop up to a Roman soldier and slip him with a knife. Yet Jesus resisted the pressure to get pushed into that mold. He had come to bring a different kind of deliverance. Luke 19.10. Let's read that one together. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Why did he come? To seek and to save what was lost. Jesus' whole purpose, to save the lost. 
His deliverance and release was to be spiritual, not political. Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for regime overthrow? No. For the forgiveness of sins. In the Bible, the Lord's name represents his power and authority. When you sign a check, you attach your name to it to either authorize it or endorse it. You make it good, effective. Jesus' power and authority, symbolized by his name, are directed toward delivering us from our moral quagmire and our objectionableness, our sins of abomination before a holy God. As he explained to the disciples after the resurrection, summarizing the, the plot line and thrust of the whole Bible, Luke 24, 46. This is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It's your Bible story in a nutshell. It's where the whole Bible leads to. The Almighty harnesses his power to serve you, to bring you to himself. Pray to him. It's about him, not us. Even though you, you wouldn't know that from his humility. So in the days following the Palm Sunday parade, the divergence between Jesus' approach to power and conventional leadership patterns becomes increasingly acutely noticeable, leading to friction. Luke 19, 45, they entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It's written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of robbers. See, he, he wants to eliminate anything that might get in the way of us enjoying relationship with him. What response does this draw from those in charge? Verse 47 on. But the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. As Jesus teaches in the temple courts, his authority is challenged by the various religious leaders, groups. The chief priests and teachers of the law, their spies, the Sadducees, this through Luke 20. Yet none of the religious power brokers were successful in tripping him up. Matthew devotes an entire chapter, Matthew 23, to Jesus' criticism of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. He warned people against the way religious power was flaunted. Luke 20. Beware the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes. They'll be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses for a show, make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. What about us? Do we wear our religion on our sleeve for all to see? Is prayer a matter of showing off? Do we go to church on Sunday and then take advantage of others during the week? Jesus defines the meaning of the Good Friday Easter event, the thrust of his life in Luke 22, 20. The same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Quickly, he contrasts this with the way most leaders use their power. 25, 27. The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules, but the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who is at the table, or the one who serves? But is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you, this one serves. Have you heard the expression, follow the money to track down the root of a problem? At Good Friday, follow the power. For the Jews, the issue is whether Jesus is the Christ. 2267, if you are the Christ, tell us. Verse 70, they all ask, are you then the Son of God? He doesn't back down from admitting it. So at the cross, it becomes their basis for mocking him. 23, 25. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. What are they saying? He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. 
For the Romans, the Gentiles, the terminology is a little different. King, not Christ, but power is still the focus. Week 23, 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ a king. Here they're, they're kind of joining the two Jewish and Roman worlds together there. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The sign over his head at the cross, indicating Jesus' crime, what he's there for, says, Luke 23, 38, This is the king of the Jews. So on that basis, the Gentile soldiers ridicule him. Listen to what they say. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. As in, you claim you have the power, prove it. The crowd is fickle. Praises one day, condemning him a few days later. Someone might object, no, that's just the general populace. What do they know? But what about the disciples? Do they stand fast even if popular opinion turned against Jesus? Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, Jesus' close inner circle, betrays him, handing him over to the religious leaders trying to kill him for a sum of money. Jesus notes the irony when they arrive to arrest him. 22.48, Jesus asks him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Such blatant insincerity. The other disciples are rattled in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is arrested partly on account of his submission to the Father's will. He simply refuses to put up a fight, accepting it as part of God's revealed plan. Mark 14, 49, Jesus said, But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And everyone deserted him and fled. <coughs> One of them, a young man, perhaps Mark the Gospel writer, is seized by his linen garment but wriggles out and escapes naked. That's the sheer panic and shame his followers felt as they fled. Now, Peter, rock solid Cephas, as his name means. What a flip flop he proved to be. Mere hours before he boasted, Luke 22, 33, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And when Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to keep watch with him in the garden while he agonizes in prayer, Peter falls asleep. At the time of the arrest, Peter cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. Jesus tells him to put his sword away. John 18, 10, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter must be getting really confused. But the clincher comes when the rooster crows at the dawn of Good Friday. Peter denies he knows Jesus three separate times. Luke 22. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. He went outside and wept bitterly. Somehow, mysteriously, Jesus was Lord and sovereign even over the events of his betrayal and crucifixion. Yet Peter freely, of his own will, had turned his back on his master when it came down to the crunch. He wasn't rock solid at all, not flinty, but fickle. When we sin, we are denying Jesus much as Peter did. Our sins drive a nail into his cross. If we love him, we will obey him. On Wednesday, I attended an area network group at Clinton with other EMCC pastors in the area, including Mitchell and Palmer School. Part of the conversation noted that much of our Western church's routines have focused on information rather than obedience. We get information from listening to the sermon. We, we read material and watch videos in our small groups to get more information. How are we on putting it into practice? Learn, trust, obey. Jesus calls us to himself, to receive him as Lord, to take his name upon ourselves and get on board, cede our wills to his direction. This is not easy. If we hear accurately what he's calling us to do, we may become hesitant, reluctant. Unnerved by his methods and his call to take up our cross daily and follow him. But it's the only way forward to be forgiven of our sins and find fellowship with the eternal God who invites us into a relationship where he's our heavenly father. 
considering how fickle and sin-riddled we are, it's an absolute wonder that God loves us. Jesus went to the cross to save those very ones who were spitting on him, who betrayed and deserted him when he needed them most. It's a good thing the Lord doesn't wait for us to get all cleaned up before making possible our redemption. Romans 5, 8, can we read this one together? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amazing love. In the words of the hymn, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my own. Recently, I listened through the Overdrive app to an audiobook borrowed from our Huron County Public Library, Jimmy Carter's Faith, A Journey for All. Yes, that Jimmy Carter, U.S. President formerly. He has long volunteered with Habitat for Humanity. In his book, he tells about that organization's origins. Habitat for Humanity was founded by Millard Fuller and his wife, Linda. As students at the University of Alabama, Millard and a partner, Morris Dees, later founder of the Southern Law Poverty Center, started several innovative ventures. One was the publication of cookbooks featuring the best recipes from the mothers of other students. And another was delivering cakes or flowers to students on birthdays or special occasions after their parents had been contacted by Fuller and Dees. After graduation, Millard married Linda and began to practice law. But he had so much money coming in from his other business ventures that he gave up his law practice. Happy problem, huh? One day, much to Millard's shock, Linda told him that she was leaving him and going to New York for marriage counseling because he was neglecting his family and seemed interested only in getting rich. Millard followed her, begged her to come back to him, and finally agreed to give away all his money and join Linda in any work they could share. Millard kept his promise and the couple soon settled on the biracial Koinonia farm just a few miles south of Plains, Georgia, and began building houses for destitute and black families. And they and their three children spent three years in Zaire as missionaries supported by some Christian groups and they developed the idea of organizing Habitat for Humanity using the theology of the hammer or economics of Jesus. This was a dream that few people believed could be realized, but working with volunteers and homeowners, Habitat has now built or renovated more than two and a half million homes in a total of 70 countries. What a ministry. Yet it all began when a man realized love meant he needed to give away all he had. God was able to give him back so much more and amplify blessing for millions of people as a result. The economics of Jesus are daunting. The cross seems like foolishness. Riding a donkey is hardly a power statement. It's a scary thing at first. But as we follow him, developing allegiance to him, we are rescued from our fickleness and find he is faithful to deliver on his promises. Consider the ancient and tested words of 2 Timothy 2, which we close. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Let us pray. Lord, we bless you. You are a faithful God. You stand by your promises and you bring it all to fruition and completion. And even as we see prophecies fulfilled in the very events of Jesus' uh, betrayal and uh, crucifixion. And Lord, thank you for not leaving it there. Thank you for the promise of new life in Jesus because of his blood poured out for us. Lord, if there's anyone here today that hasn't responded to you already, Please open their hearts to do so, to embrace you, and to give themselves to you as you have given yourself.